So, yes, welcome to this lecture. I work at the Faculty of Law of the University of Groningen, but I feel very connected to both the University of Groningen and Utrecht University because I did my PhD and I also studied in Utrecht. So, and now I work uh, at the Faculty of Law in Groningen and I have various affiliations, including founding member of a research center called Global Health of Groningen, and I'm also actively involved with the Aletta Jacob School of Public Health. So let's see, let's move to um, the next uh, slide. I'm going to talk about um, um, the current crisis in light of international law and human rights. And I'll give an introduction soon, but I'm going to talk about two parallel regimes. So on the one hand, the regime of the World Health Organization that is very important in the current crisis, and specifically the international health regulations. And in that context, the role of the World Health Organization. And the other regime that I'm going to talk about is human rights law. So I'm going to talk about the human rights regime of the United Nations and a bit about its origins and nature, the standards, and also again, the implications at the domestic level. Now, I don't know if it's um, visible for you, but I have a little icon here to the right. Can you see it? Yes, it's a, and it's a, a jet icon. And I, I'm using this icon every now and then throughout the slides to ask you a question so that you can respond. But of course, we will also create opportunities for you to ask questions. But for now, can I just test this system and ask you a first question, where are you from? Because I think it's interesting to know where you're from, and also, also to be able to relate to that a little bit. So can you type in uh, your country of origin, just to have a little bit of a flavor of uh, what we have in the room uh, this evening? Wow, and I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but it's coming in. Um, we are represented by people from all over the world. In, in oh, the very can you mention country. just a few countries to me? Yeah, so the Netherlands, of course, Groningen, Utrecht, Romania, Greece, um, Brazil, another person from Brazil, Croatia, Russia, um, Friesland, as a, as a wow. special student in the Netherlands, um, Italy, uh, Germany, Iraq, um, Suriname, Siberia, Saudi Arabia, Bedum, in Turkey, I presume, Cyprus. Fantastic. Well, welcome everybody from all over the world. I can see I'm very impressed. I hope you are all well and uh, let's continue our lecture. So today is uh, Liberation Day in the Netherlands. If I look outside, I see the flag of my neighbor. Um, we, we celebrate the fact that uh, on the 5th of May, 1945, uh, we were uh, freed from the Nazi regime, which was a very important historic moment in time. And at the time, it was, of course, the end of a crisis. And today we are again in, in a crisis, of course, a completely different crisis. But also in this particular crisis, the crisis that we are in now, human rights play a vital role. And I'm going to talk about that later in my lecture. Now, the end of the, the Second World War, the period after 1945, marked a, a time of rebuilding the nation, the Netherlands and other countries after a period of crisis. And you can say it was also a time of idealism and a time of optimism. And uh, in that spirit, World Health Organization was established and also human rights mechanisms were established. And the human rights mechanisms were also especially established as a in, in, an, in a way as a response to the atrocities committed during the Second World War. And with the idea that such atrocities should not be uh, happen again and that mechanisms should be adopted to protect us, societies, from such horrendous forms of state abuse. Now, but I wanted to start with that first regime, right? That regime of the World Health Organization that is also so important for infectious disease control. And, uh, but let's first talk about how this started, this World Health Organization. There was already in 1945, in that spirit of optimism, a conference in San Francisco. And of course there was much debate, but there was, for example, one memorandum from Archbishop Spellman. You see him on the slides to the right. And in that mem memorandum, and I think that's interesting, he said, medicine is one of the pillars of peace. 
So clearly establishing the link between medicine, between health, if you like, and peace. I thought that was an interesting notion. And at that conference, the idea of a World Health Organization was formally adopted. And one year later, uh, WHO was more or less established and it formally um, uh, became active uh, as from 1948. Now, and in 1948, that is then also when the founding document uh, of the World Health Organization entered into force, became law. And that is the constitution of the World Health Organization. And it's a really important document. It's such an important document because it is of great inspiration to human rights as well. Let me show you that in a second. But what it also does in its preamble, in the beginning text, is that it gives a definition of health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, this is a very interesting definition. It has been criticized frequently for being too absolute, for guaranteeing something that can never be guaranteed by a state, complete health. I mean, if we feel that way, one second a day, that's already fantastic, isn't it? But at the same time, there's a lot of um, goodness in that text. It, it's a very holistic definition in the sense that it doesn't talk only about absence of disease uh, or physical health, but it also mentions clearly mental and social well-being. So that's the strength of the definition, I think. What the Constitution also did was recognizing health as a human right, the right to the highest attainable standard of health. I'll come back to that later in my lecture, but that's very important. And this phrase clearly inspired the human rights treaties that were adopted in the decennia afterwards. Now, and if important uh, for infectious disease control was that, that in the uh, constitution was also a basis for adopting regulations and conventions. So in the constitution, it says that World Health Organization can adopt regulations and conventions. What is at the same time extremely disappointing is that over the past 70 years, World Health Organization has adopted very little law to the extent that there's only three binding instruments. The most important convention, there's only one convention, I should say, is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. I've done a lot of research in that field, but that's of course not the topic of today. And the other regulation, which is very similar to a convention uh, because it's also binding, although uh, states have not formally endorsed it, are the international health regulations focusing on infectious disease control. Let me zoom in on that a bit more. So these international health regulations that are uh, in force since 2007, so they were adopted in 2005, uh, can be traced back to similar health regulations from the past. And what you see is that countries have collaborated in the field of infectious disease control since the 1850s already. So for more than 150 years, countries have already been collaborating in that field. Also because they saw that you know, diseases spread across borders, so there's clearly a need to, to, to agree uh, on things in that context. So since 1903, um, we've had international sanitary regulations. And um, since the World Health Organization is in force since 1948, we've had three sets of these regulations in 1951, 1969, and in 2005. So these new international health regulations again are enforced since 2007 and since then we've had a range of emergencies for example ebola in west africa 2014 a very important one and um, we've also had zika in south america 2016 which you will also remember and now covid 19 in china so this is an important regime that regime of the international health regulations is um, functions as such, in the sense that it takes a very broad approach, contrary to the previous reg uh, regulations. So this new instrument, these new international health regulations, take an all hazards approach. All threats to public health 
are addressed by these health regulations, whereas the previous ones only addressed a limited set of diseases. And in addition to that, it, it, I cannot, it's a huge, very long uh, document, but I want to flag a few things that um, are important in this instrument and are also relevant for the current crisis. Firstly, the, the idea of core capacities, and I think this is very interesting also for people with a medical background, because it talks about what your health system should look like, how it should be equipped in order to address an infectious disease outbreak. So requirements regarding the public health infrastructure. There should be a capacity to detect, assess, notify, and report. I think this is interesting. And um, if you Google WHO Europe and then core capacity, you will see a website where you see how countries across Europe perform. And it shows that European countries perform really well. And there you may ask yourself questions because we've seen all these shortages, shortages in the uh, corona crisis, haven't we? Shortages in terms of medical equipment, ICU beds, masks, gloves, medicines, and so on. That makes you wonder. So I think this is something to research further. There's another website from an organization called JEE that you may wish to look at. That's an independent US organization that independently investigates how countries comply with the core capacities. And maybe their findings are a bit more critical. Another important uh, uh, condition in the health regulations is that members are to notify within 24 hours the World Health Organization in case they detect what they think is an emergency. And then WHO will research that outbreak and can declare that there is a public health emergency of international concern. And then it can issue temporary recommendations to the country concerned, and then there will be this collaboration between this country and the World Health Organization. It's all very much focused on collaboration, right? So there's no sanctions in the international health regulations, no naming and shaming. And that's something that's up for debate, of course, also in the current corona crisis. Because we are also seeing that the current corona crisis is becoming a little bit of a political crisis. For example, um, the criticism is that the World Health Organization, or I'm sorry, China, took more than 24 hours to report to the World Health Organization about the outbreak of the disease, right? It took a few weeks in December. At the same time, if you compare this situation with Ebola in, um, in West Africa, for example, this is a lot faster and the whole collaboration and, and also the response from, from uh, World Health Organization was a lot more effective. So, um, yeah, there is, of course, uh, the criticism from our uh, US President Trump to this whole situation. Um, Trump has um, maybe one or two weeks ago withdrawn uh, US funding to the World Health Organization. US contributes around $220 million each year and it has now suspended that funding. And um, yeah, I think that's very disappointing. Um, and the US is the largest funder, so this is something to discuss and what we should also discuss perhaps is the fact that there's no sanction mechanisms within the framework of the World Health Organization. Whether that's disappointing, I would argue that this collaboration is very important. But this is a moment where I would like to invite you maybe to respond a bit and to ask a question if you like. Um, do you as an expert consider the reaction of WHO is adequate? And I presume, yeah. That's a question to you. I would say that the World Health Organization is an incredibly important organization with an incredible amount of expertise. And uh, not everything they do is perfect, but it is the best we have. And uh, it should be improved. And it should, uh, firstly, uh, receive a lot more funding from states. A lot of the money uh, that they receive is also donated privately. That is a good thing. But as a result of that, a lot of that money is earmarked. And what we want is funding from states that can be spent freely. 
uh, by WHO. I think it's a very important organization that we should all support. And I'm, I'm confused about this idea of, of naming and shaming and sanctioning and whether the international health regulations should embrace that or have that or whether they should be modified in that way. I, I'm also afraid that you, you scare countries with those kind of mechanisms and that the collaboration is extremely important. So, you know, there's also some, some students from the, uh, from the Netherlands in the room, I'm sure. And, and uh, so what does this national legislation in the field look like? So in the Netherlands, we have implemented the international health regulations through the Wet Publieke Gezondheid, the Public Health Act. And uh, based on that act, COVID-19 is qualified as a so-called A-type disease. As a result of that, uh, very drastic measures can be imposed. And uh, we have safety regions in the Netherlands um, uh, that can then uh, adopt certain emergency regulations that provide a basis for enforcement. So there is clearly a certain enforcement and sanction mechanisms in the Netherlands. And these are also questions of human rights, because how far do you go in taking your measures, right? Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, later. But I first wanted to, to show this as a mechanism and uh, also to indicate that this mechanism is um, intertwined with human rights law. And this is also where international health regulations and human rights come together. But that brings me to human rights law. And uh, I think this is an extremely uh, important regime uh, in any crisis, but also uh, in a situation where there's no crisis. And I think it's really important to start a little bit at the beginning of human rights. Uh, don't worry, it won't take too long, but I think there's uh, quite some sometimes uh, talk about human rights without really understanding what we are talking about. It's clear that human rights in the way we know them today have been adopted since the Second World War. A world war but they are also an evolutionary phenomenon that has matured over time and there's a lot of interesting references to human rights throughout history to give you one um, perhaps uh, old example in the greek uh, tragedy antigone um, uh, there's an interesting reference to human rights in the sense that antigone is wants to bury one of her brothers so both brothers have killed each other in a fight, and one of the two brothers was against the king, her uncle, and Antigone uh, goes against the laws of her uncle and invokes a higher law, the laws of the gods to be entitled to bury her brothers. So this tension between a national law and a higher law is what we also see in the Greek uh, tragedy Antigone. Now, what's also important to know in relation to human rights is that we have, in fact, three types of human rights. And sometimes we call them generations of human rights. And the interesting thing about the term generations is that it shows how they, human rights, different types of human rights can be traced back to different times in history. Although at the same time, this term generations is a little bit outdated because um, we are now sort of um, all agree uh, at least at the level of the United Nations, that all these human rights are interrelated and that they re reinforce each other. But okay, the first generation of human rights is civil and political rights. And civil and political rights can be traced back to the Age of Enlightenment. And the Age of Enlightenment around 1800 is clearly a time where philosophers like Locke and Hobbes talked about the social contracts and this idea that those who are in power should do something in exchange for that power. And again, also that idea of natural rights, rights that we have because simply because we are human beings. So that's the age of enlightenment and civil and political rights. Then the second type of human rights are the so-called economic, social and cultural rights that can be traced back to industrial revolution. So the 19th uh, century. And uh, that was a time of unprecedented growth, but at the same time also harsh working conditions, child labor, poor living conditions, infectious diseases like cholera. And that um, triggered uh, the coming to existence of the establishment of social rights. So a social rights movement came to existence 
and as such also the broader thinking about economic, social and cultural rights in the way that we know them today. Um, the third category of rights that I wanted to mention here are the so-called collective rights. So these are rights that we own as a col collectivity, so not so much as an individual with the, as with the first two categories of rights, but rights that we own as a collectivity. And that's, uh, those rights can be traced back to the era of decolonization from the 1950s, because that was a time where the colonized peoples claimed their independence. So they claimed their collective right to self-determination. These collective rights, I would argue, are also very important today in an era of environmental degradation, in an era of climate change. This is where we, as a, as a collectivity, as a, as a people, um, want to claim these kind of collective rights. I have a little chat moment here on the screen because I wanted to ask you, maybe you can give an example of what you think is an economic and social rights, very briefly. And we'll come back to these rights later. Let me give you myself uh, examples of civil and political rights are, for example, the right to life, freedom of expression, the right to a fair trial. But can you give an example of an economic and social rights? And maybe an economic and social right that is important in the current crisis. What do you think? Is somebody already typing something, Joyce? Um, Elena says right to health. Daniela, right to work. Uh, vacation days. Uh, someone mentions um, those okay. are the. But this, this is perfect. Uh, free trade housing. Another housing. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, free trade and housing are also mentioned. And uh, there are two yes. questions for you too. So that's uh, also good to know. Okay. Do you want me to continue or uh, do you want me to address these questions? Uh, um, I think these two questions are very much linked because they talk about um, accountability mechanisms. Um, right. I'm now trying to... Shall I come back to that later? Because it's uh, later in my lecture that I will talk briefly about that. Yes, yeah? perfect. Thank you. Right, so we have these three types of, um, of, of uh, rights. And, but again, this Second World War is so important for the origins of human rights. And here you see Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of the former president of the US. She uh, became involved in, in the adoption of the first international human rights instrument, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was adopted in 1948. And it's a very comprehensive document and adopted again very much in response to the atrocities committed during the Second World War. So it contains many rights. I can recommend you to have a look at it uh, and just to see what types of rights are in there. And since then, standard setting started. So here you see the most important human rights treaties adopted within the framework of the United Nations. And the first two treaties go back to this distinction between civil and political rights and uh, economic, social and cultural rights. And, and the fact that these two treaties were adopted separately has to do with the Cold War because no agreement could be reached on which rights were more important. So the East stressed the importance of economic, social and cultural rights, former USSR, whereas the United States emphasized very much the uh, civil and political human rights. And up till today, and this is perhaps interesting to mention also in the current COVID crisis, China is not a party to, not a formal party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And as a result of that, doesn't uh, recognize at least the rights in that particular treaty. And the US is not a party to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And as such, it doesn't recognize the right to health in that treaty, for example. But on this list, you see uh, a number of, um, thematic treaties uh, um, focusing on racial discrimination, torture, and forced disappearances. And you also see treaties protecting a particular vulnerable group in society, women, children, migrant workers, disabilities. And you can say that uh, a treaty on disabilities is very important in the current crisis, right? We have a disability treaty and that's important because disabled persons are very uh, vulnerable in, in the current crisis. What we do not have, as you can see on the list, is a treaty protecting the rights of older persons. And there's actually debate about whether such a treaty should be adopted. 
And actually, I attended a meeting last fall in Geneva discussing the possibility of such a treaty, which I think is a very interesting development. We have similar treaties at the regional level. For example, within the framework of the Council of Europe in Europe, we have similar treaties, um, but we also have them in the Americas and in Africa. Unfortunately, we don't have them yet in Asia. And in connection to these treaties, there are so-called monitoring mechanisms for states to show that they comply with these treaties. And these can be human rights courts, although we have very few human rights courts, complaint bodies, reporting procedures, special rapporteurs, for example. And when it comes to these courts, you can first go to your national court if you think your human rights have been violated. And after what they call exhaustion of local remedies, when you're done at the national level, you can go to a human rights court. For example, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. But that's a long path, of course. Now, I want to say also something about what are human rights? And I want to mention four key features of human rights. Firstly, this notion of human dignity. We can say that the whole body of human rights is aimed at protecting our human dignity, our dignity as human beings. We have this dignity simply because we are human beings. Whether we are a doctor, whether we are a criminal, whether we are a criminal doctor, we all have human dignity that needs to be protected. And this dignity translates into rights, rights that we all have, eh, rights that we all have as, as right holders. And I mention here some rights that are particularly important in the COVID crisis. Rights to privacy, physical integrity, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, right to health, right to education. And you can already see civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights are all important in this crisis. And states have to guarantee our rights. That's what it's all about, right? States have legal obligations to guarantee our rights. And there you see that idea of a social contract appearing again. They have negative obligations in the sense that they should respect our freedom of expression, for example. And they have positive obligations in the sense that they should take action to guarantee, for example, our access to healthcare facilities. And my fourth point is that a key principle underlying the whole body of human rights law is this principle of non-discrimination and the fact that human rights are very much designed to protect those who are vulnerable in society. Now, very briefly, the American Declaration of Independence is a beautiful document, I think, that was adopted in 1776 because it talks about all these things that are so important in human rights. Inalienable rights, rights that we have simply because we are human beings. Governments have to guarantee our rights and it's about the consent of the government. But, of course, the main analysis is about human rights in the time of Corona. And here you see that both economic, social and cultural rights and civil and political rights are important in this crisis. And I've marked the right to health in red because uh, it, I think it's the key right in this crisis. And it is very much what we see in this crisis on the one hand, governments are trying their utmost to realize, to guarantee the right to health, but that sometimes goes to the detriment of other rights. For example, the right to education, because when schools are closed to secure public health, that impacts on access to education for children, for example. And measures taken to protect health may also affect our freedom of movement, our right to privacy, Right? So it's about a balancing these rights. And in particular, then asking ourselves, how far should we go in guaranteeing the right to health? Um, and uh, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this right to health because that's the key in our analysis. And what's a really very important component uh, in the right to health is the so-called triple AQ. And you find that in general common 14, it was uploaded as one of the instruments that you were able to read in preparation of this lecture. And the triple AQ says that governments need to guarantee the availability, the accessibility, the acceptability and the quality of all health related services. So maybe it can also be linked a bit to this 
a requirement of four capacities of the state. What does this triple AQ mean in relation to COVID-19? What are states supposed to do? They are supposed to guarantee that medical equipment is available to a sufficient amount, right? Uh, and, they, um, and, and health services should also be affordable uh, and there should be this geographic spread of healthcare services. I would love to discuss this more elaborately with you, but unfortunately there is uh, not sufficient time. What I would also like to indicate, because I think this is, this is really important, is, is um, this idea of suspension of civil and political rights. Think about freedom of movement. How far do we go in limiting freedom of movement? And you can see that there's two suspension models, if you like. There's suspension light, and that is what we have more or less adopted in the Netherlands, is where for each individual right, we, we determine how far we go in limiting the rights. And then the principle of proportionality plays an important role. Does the severity of the measure justify the public health problem? So that's what we do in the Netherlands, a constant balancing of how far we should go in limiting human rights to freedom of movement, right to privacy, and so on. The more drastic model is where you derogate from rights. And that's what around 15 countries in Europe have more or less adopted. And it means that you set aside rights completely for everyone in society. So right to privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of movement. Right, and um, some rights remain intact, including right to life, prohibition of torture, but the other rights can be set aside completely. That's something to follow very closely. Think about freedom of expression and the idea that states can set aside freedom of expression. It is very important that healthcare providers, journalists, and so on can express their concerns. And if they are not able to do so, then that is disconcerting. So it's something to follow and to monitor closely. I've talked so far very much about um, the human rights responsibilities of governments, but we may, ask our, may also ask ourselves, do we have human rights responsibilities, society at large and other actors in society? And there is a beautiful basis for that in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that every individual and every organ of society has human rights responsibilities. Now, the question is, of course, what do these uh, human rights responsibilities uh, look like? Maybe we can brainstorm a little bit about that. Would you like to respond to this or maybe to, to some of the other things that have been that I've uh, discussed so far? I realize I've maybe gone a bit fast through the slides, but uh, let's pause a little bit and see if there is uh, some questions here. Uh, maybe the question of Eloisa to start. Um, I'm checking. Eloisa, I'm giving you speaking privileges. Can you please elaborate on your question? Uh, yes, um, I was wondering, because uh, you listed the series of treaties that guarantees um, rights for specific uh, target groups, such as uh, um, people with disabilities or women, um, and you were discussing the possibility of starting a treaty that was guaranteeing specifically older people. I was wondering if this is um, effective as a way of dealing with human rights, because uh, intuitively, every time I uh, think about human rights, I think if those rights are guaranteed to humans as such, then there shouldn't be the need uh, of uh, making treaties that target specific categories, but an old person, for example, should be already be protected just for the fact of being a human. I don't know if it's clear. It's just yeah, something it's I always think about when I read about treaties. Uh, it's a very interesting question, and it's a very good question as well. Um, you, you say, in a way, you know, um, why don't we just have generic treaties protecting everyone in society? At the same time, these uh, specific uh, treaties can also protect something specific. For example, if you look at CEDAW, the Women's Rights Treaty, you see, for example, a provision on reproductive health rights. And that's, of course, very important. And if you go to the Children's Rights 
Convention. By the way, that's the most widely ratified treaty around the world, so a very authoritative treaty. You see there the protection of the best interest of the child, so that specific emphasis on the vulnerability of children. I would say it's important, but um, the idea of a treaty protecting the rights of older persons is controversial. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, we have about 20 more minutes. Um, I'm not sure where you are in, in your whole lecture. Would you like to continue or is it time for one more question? Yes, then it's time for one more question. I thought uh, we had less, but you want to continue until 8? Yeah. Yeah. Great. yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, let's see, there are a few outstanding questions. I think T's questions. I'm not sure what your full first name is, but T. Um, had a question um, about derogation. I'm going to see if I can unmute you. Um, I think you may have just, oh, there you are. Okay, T, would you like to ask your question? If, or maybe he just, or she just said, oh, Bianca, you also just asked a question linked to, I think, what was also discussed just now. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, so I was thinking, um, you talked about um, freedom of speech as a human rights freedom. Yeah. Uh, but now in times of coronavirus, we have seen a lot of like conspiracy theories coming up, like the 5G or uh, a lot of fake news about the coronavirus situation. Uh, how, what is your opinion regarding this uh, freedom of speech in times of corona? Because it can, be, it can also harm efforts that governments are doing, such as social isolation, if people start believing those things. And for example, Twitter and Facebook, they started already like uh, banning like, uh, misleading information or fake news. So yeah, I, I was just wondering. Yeah, that's, that's another great question. So if you allow, allow uh, unlimited freedom of speech, there will be uh, a lot of fake news that can also harm people, right? And, um, and you're saying that's, that, that you are maybe worried about that, and I agree with you. So on the one hand, it's, it's this governmental duty, I would say, to ensure that um, there's no uh, false information about the disease. And at the same time, there is this obligation to guarantee freedom of speech um, in a way that people who have certain professional roles, for example, or patients can express their concerns. But I realize that this is difficult. Yeah. That's a good point. Any further questions? Thank you for answering my question. Um, Ma, uh, um, uh, there were the two outstanding questions about accountability. Is that still um, going to be discussed in a minute or should we yeah. wait? Um, I have a slide on accountability more towards the end. So. Okay, we'll just hold off. Yeah. If you can continue, then we keep the other questions for until the end. So, yes, yeah, so I, I, this is where I uh, was. Um, so I talked about the responsibilities of society at large. So on the one hand, governments have legal obligations to guarantee our rights, but there's also a broader debate as to what are the responsibilities of maybe us as well as a society. It's maybe also a call, this whole crisis, on our solidarity, right, to each other. Um, so I think this, this basis in the Universal Declaration is, is interesting in that sense. Um, then we can also make an analysis of COVID-19 uh, in, in the Netherlands. And we have now again both economic, social and cultural rights and we have civil and political rights. And if I may make a very superficial analysis, then uh, allow me to do so on a point-by-point on -point basis. For example, in relation to the right to health, we can ask ourselves, did our government, the Dutch government, for example, respond too late to the crisis, right? Is there sufficient care for corona patients? That's also a question of the right to health. Is there a lack of equipment? And what's not on the slide, but what I could add here is um, generic care. That to, to what extent is, is general care still av sufficiently available across the country? 
So these are all questions that you can ask yourself from the perspective of the right to health. From the perspective of the right to education, we can talk about access to schooling for children. And when it comes to civil and political rights, we can um, question, and this has also been done by some legal scholars in the Netherlands, these uh, emergency directives and the role of the so-called super majors in the Netherlands. And does that set aside um, democratic oversight from parliament, from uh, the local councils? We can talk about um, freedom of uh, expression. We can talk about right to privacy and these special apps, for example. So these are all questions that we can ask ourselves. The crisis is a moving target. Everything changes every day and I hesitate to make very clear pronouncements about where uh, rights have been violated. Uh, we should also be a bit patient and understanding with our government that is in such a difficult situation. At the same time, we should follow these things close, closely and maybe afterwards evaluate where did we uh, take the right decision and where did we go wrong? Perhaps maybe from the perspective of your country, you would also like to respond to this. So an, another moment maybe to, for people to briefly respond. It can also be in a written chat, just an observation. What you think is going on from the perspective of economic, social and cultural rights, civil and political rights, or even balancing these rights. If you read anything interesting, Joyce, uh, that comes in, uh, you may want to read it. Uh, Elena is making the observation um, that there are so many varied approaches uh, within the European Union country uh, or European Union members. Um, and she's wondering uh, whether a more uniform approach via supranational structure might be better. Um, my I brief answer is yes. I, I think we need more collaboration within the World Health Organization. We need more collaboration within the EU. I think it has become very clear that uh, across the EU uh, there was insufficient collaboration. And, and, it, and this crisis shows how important it is to collaborate. So it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Agatha sent me also a message. Um, Agatha, would you like to elaborate on your comment? Uh, it links the, what you discussed with the uh, real-life working context of medical doctors. Kaz, if you would like to speak, you can. Otherwise, I can also ask your question for you. Okay. Um, so she indicates uh, that medical doctors working in an ICU or hospital have the same rights, especially to health, as everyone has. Um, when um, can you, in, as a doctor, refuse to work in a hot zone to ensure your right to health is being respected? Wow. Well, let, let, let first, your, your question uh, is, is interesting and we can ask ourselves, what is the position of doctors from the perspective of human rights? I think they, they can also be seen as a vulnerable group in that sense that, uh, that needs uh, protection because they uh, work on the front lines, they're exposed to the disease. So that's something to be uh, very uh, aware of. Um, can they refuse uh, their work? Well, I'm not sure if that is a question of uh, international human rights. It's, it's um, more even a contractual uh, question and it's a question of uh, you have your Hippocratic oath, don't you? So you have, you, you have a duty uh, uh, of care, to give care, and uh, can you refuse that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, your answer also answers a question from Ulf, um, who asked uh, about whether doctors should be uh, in a position to report directly to WHO, but your explanation on the, what is the level of um, accountability and enforcement and the contract, with who do you have a contract, I think covers this question too. Um, there well, are I think it's very important that doctors should be able to speak out uh, and speak freely about their concerns and that society and government allows them to speak out. So that's, that's a really vital condition in such a crisis, I think. They should be given a voice. Yeah, and I um, and to link it back to the question you posed to the participants, uh, Lotte, Peter, and Roos um, shared their thoughts. Um, Lotte indicates that culture, uh, cultures, and people in Europe are different, and that makes uh, a single approach 
yeah. uh, probably means impossible. So how do we take context into account also to make sure it's uh, feasible to do in different countries? Um, Peter uh, observes that um, in the Netherlands there was or is an unjustified inequity or inequality between hospital care and elderly care, uh, where the weak were not protected. Um, yeah. yeah. And Rose Jung observes how weird it is actually that we have borders again between the Netherlands and yeah. Belgium um, in this new world. Well, I, th I think all your observations and questions show uh, how much uh, human rights are implicated in this crisis. And that it's really important to, uh, to talk about uh, how human rights uh, come into play here and uh, whether they are violated or not. And I agree also with one of the commentators that uh, indeed people in care homes are among the most vulnerable in this crisis. And that is maybe something we at the start have underestimated. Um, I talked about um, the responsibilities of everyone in society. And uh, if we talk about uh, the responsibility of everyone in society, every actor in society, I should say, then we may also wish to speak about the responsibilities of um, non-state actors like uh, multinational corporations. And corporations that are very important in, the, in, the, in this particular crisis are, of course, the pharmaceutical industry, um, because they have a really important role to play in, in developing medicines, developing a vaccine uh, in this crisis. And uh, so what does human rights law have to say about what are the responsibilities of the pharmaceutical industry as a multinational corporation. Now, <clears throat> you should know that formally, that only states are bound by these human rights treaties. So only states are formally bound by the treaties and have to realize the, treat the rights that are in there towards society. But it is now increasingly recognized that given the power and influence they exert over our health and well-being, corporations also have human rights responsibilities. So it is not so much said that they have legal obligations, but they have responsibilities towards society. And what is now uh, recognized is that corporations, including the pharmaceutical industry, have a responsibility to respect human rights. So that's not a, a positive obligation to provide care, for example. No, it's only this negative obligation to refrain from violating human rights. And then you can ask yourself, of course, uh, hmm, what does that mean uh, for the pharmaceutical industry? Well, it can, in my view, mean something like being transparent about how you conduct your business. It would, in my view, also be a uh, responsibility to, um, uh, to be transparent about how the price of your product is composed. It would, in my view, also be a responsibility not to withhold essential information about drugs, about vaccines, uh, for the sake of your own profit. This is really not a time where um, a, a companies should go madly after their own profit. So that is a remark about pharmaceutical industry and their human rights responsibilities. If you're interested in this responsibility to respect human rights, I encourage you to Google Ruggie principles, because these principles were adopted by the former UN Special Rapporteur on Business and Human Rights. You, um, Ruggie, yes. Now, and that is then uh, the, the final slide about uh, accountability. And um, yes, of course, I already indicated that in relation to all these human rights treaties, there are uh, monitoring mechanisms, but we can also look more broadly in, uh, into how does human rights law create accountability. Now, there are broadly speaking legal mechanisms and other mechanisms that you can look at and that you can use. So if you think your human rights have been violated, you can go to your domestic court with a human rights violation. And then after that, you may go to uh, a regional court or uh, a complaint body at the level of the United Nations. By the way, the United Nations doesn't have a human rights court. But you can also think of claims against the industry, for example, against the pharmaceutical industry. There you can go to your domestic court and uh, you may start a criminal case. It could be a human rights case. There are possibilities there. 
but in, 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 in addition to thinking about court cases and about this idea of naming and shaming, you could also think in terms of other mechanisms where you can seek justice, where you can address human rights violations. So my remark is actually also that when you want to uh, achieve something in the field of human rights, you don't necessarily have to think about a court case or legal mechanism only. There's other fora where you can address uh, human rights violations as well. You can go to parliament, you can go to an ombudsman, potentially many countries have a national human rights institution. Many institutions like hospitals have complaint bodies. And then there's also non-governmental organizations that do very important work. And lastly, of course, uh, there's also uh, the media that play an important uh, role. Now, when it comes to a legal court case, we've had, of course, in the Netherlands, uh, a very important, uh, the Urgenda uh, court case, very important case in relation to climate change. That case, by the way, was also very clearly based on human rights. So that's an important uh, example. I reached a point of questions and comments. Um, so there's a little bit of time for further questions and comments. What I would like to say is, before we continue, we were, every year we do a summer school, but did you, this year we were unable to organize a summer school. So we've gone digital with this summer school. So there will be a few free mod modules um, uh, online in July. So if you're interested in that, you're welcome to contact us.